Up next, we have uh, Anne Purvis. Anne is the Director of Design Operations at, oh, no Q&A, sorry. Anne Purvis is the Director of Design Operations at Pinterest. So whether you have a team of ops people to help you execute or you are a team of one with no ops experience, you will walk away with this talk with tactics to bring some calm to the chaos by creating efficiencies, role clarity, and alignment within your org. Anne has not only shaped the role of ops within the organization, but also championed design through the rapid growth of the company. Let's have a big round of applause for Anne Purvis. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Anne, um, and I know I'm the only thing standing between all of us and lunch, so I promise <laughs> to keep the pace moving here. Uh, so I'm excited to be here today um, talking to all of you because chances are if you've decided to um, stay for this talk, you might be feeling a little bit of this on your teams, a little bit of operational problems, maybe a little bit daunted about how to bring some calm to the chaos. And so my goal for this talk is to give you, one, some reassurance that the problems you're facing are likely not totally unique, that other teams are facing the same type of problems. And I'm also gonna share some tactics and templates with you that have worked in my career. And my hope is that you feel empowered to take these and try them on your team as well. But first, a little bit about me. I started my career actually in the music industry in New York, where I worked for a music production company that worked with a lot of ad agencies, creating music for commercials and TV shows. And I started at the front desk and worked up to an associate producer position. And after some time there, I moved to California and worked for Jawbone, which is a hardware company. And I worked on their portable Bluetooth speakers. I was the first producer on the design team. I don't think it was called producer at that time. It was basically like, hey, this team's a mess. You seem organized. Can you help us? From Jawbone, I went to Method, the design agency, not the soap company, where I worked in client services. And Method brought me to Pinterest, where I started as a producer, and I'm leading our design ops uh, discipline. So as you can tell, my path wasn't exactly as linear as the slide would suggest. And the common theme between all of these are that they're a design-driven company, very creative, and <clears throat> they have a lot of ambiguous, messy problems. And if there's anything I've learned about myself over my career is I love diving into really messy problems and trying to bring some organization. So having been in a variety of different environments, from music to hardware, design agency, and now a growing tech company, I've been faced with a number of challenges and I've learned the importance of being able to constantly adapt. So I'm gonna walk you through some of the most common challenges that I've encountered up until this point, how I tackled them, and what I learned. These are the three common themes that I run into time and time again. Alignment, documentation, and adaptability. And a lot of the problems fall into one of these three buckets. So let's start with alignment. This is the number one problem that I've encountered every single place that I've worked. And you might be experiencing some misalignment in your org today. Ultimately, this is why the discipline of design ops was created and it continues to grow. And some common problems that I hear that fall into the bucket of alignment are, my partners don't know what design does. When is that shipping? Wait, you're working on that? My team is working on that might sound familiar. <laughs> and each of these problems stem from three things. That's a lack of empathy, lack of alignment, and lack of visibility. So lack of empathy. I have my own things to focus on. I don't really care what you're focusing on. Lack of alignment, your priority is not my priority. And lack of visibility. I don't know what you do and how that impacts me. So let's start with building some empathy. <laughs> Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of others. And while this may seem fluffy and touchy-feely, it is fundamental to building healthy and collaborative teams. So when I started at Jawbone, the relationship between design and edge felt a lot like this slide. 
Design was frustrated with Eng because they'd always say no to whatever designs they created. Eng was equally frustrated with design because they feel like things were just thrown over the fence with no consideration of Eng constraints or timelines. This was exacerbated by the fact that the two teams sat in completely different cities, about a 45 minute drive apart in the Bay Area. And so it was my job to figure out how to break down these barriers so that we could move our work forward. So the solution was pretty simple, face-to-face -face time. And I cannot stress the positive impact that this had on my team at Jawbone. And at Jawbone, this meant that I personally drove our designers down to South Bay, which, which is where the engineers worked, twice a week, so that the designers could meet the humans that were building our product. And putting faces behind names immediately built up relationships and built empathy between engine design. They could sit together for a couple hours each week, collaborate, talk about feasibility. And in my experience, 80% of collaboration happens outside of meetings. And that's exponentially increased when you're in the same physical proximity as somebody else. And you can just lean over and say, what do you think about this? Is this would this work? Could we build this? But some of you might be thinking, well, cool, but my team's remote. They're spread all over. And sure, remote is a little bit trickier, but here are some things that have worked on my team at Jawbone and that continue to work at Pinterest. Number one, camera's always on. It's kind of a no-brainer, but there are nuances in communication that are completely lost if we hide behind our screens. And this might mean even when you're in a meeting and people are in the same room, everyone turn on their individ individual camera so that the person who's remote can see everybody's face and not just a room filled with people. Daily stand-ups are also pretty helpful. Uh, these usually happen at the beginning of every day. Everyone hops online for about 15 minutes, says hello, and just says what their priority and focus for the day is. And then quarterly, or at a minimum, semi-annual meetups, to creating a space for people to come together in real life to meet, talk, and socialize. Investing in communicating with your remote folks will strengthen relationships, build trust, build empathy, and ultimately increase your productivity. All right, alignment. I couldn't come to Canada and not have a Trudeau gift. <laughs> all right, so making sure that we're all working towards the same goal. It takes a lot of people to build a product. And because of that, misalignments happen really easily. So some things that I've found helpful are one, creating role clarity, and this idea of pre-mortems, which I'll dive into a little bit. So first, role clarity. It seems like a no-brainer, but how many of us have been in a meeting and you're not entirely sure who's owning what? Yeah. I've experienced this a lot, especially in design ops, because it's a relatively new field, and I feel like I'm constantly redefining or defining for my cross-functional partners what I'm doing, what my scope is, and what my team scope is. So one tool that I found really helpful in helping create role clarity is the idea of a team charter. And your team charter is essentially your elevator pitch. What is your purpose? What are your responsibilities? And what, su what does success look like in your role? So here's an example of our ops team charter at Pinterest. And this has been a helpful tool in not only aligning my team around what we do and how we talk about it, but it's also been a really helpful tool or one pager to be able to share with my cross-functional partners to create clarity around ops in our scope. But if you don't want to create a team charter, maybe it's not applicable to you, another extremely quick and easy way to create role clarity is this idea of a round robin. And that's basically when you go around the room, typically at the beginning of a project, ideally, and everyone just says a couple sentences of what they're doing on that project and what they're going to be responsible for owning. So an example of this looks like, hi, I'm Anne. I'm the program manager on this project. I'm responsible for all cross-functional communication in relation to this project and making sure that our partners have visibility into what we're doing. I'll be tracking our progress, calling out misalignments, and making sure that we stay on, on track and schedule. And that's it. It's amazing when you go around the room and have everybody do that exercise, how quickly people become aligned, and it creates clarity so people know who's doing what and who to go to if they have a question. 
So another way to get alignment is this idea of a premortem, which I'm actually really excited about. I just learned about this from one of our edge managers, and I've tried it on a few projects that I've worked on, and it's been really successful. So I want to share it with all of you. You probably heard about the idea of a postmortem or retrospective. After a big project, you get everyone together, say, okay, what went well, what didn't go well, and how are we going to move forward? The premortem is this idea, only you do it before the project even starts. And you ask your team two questions. It's 2020, Project X shipped. It was a huge success. What did we do well? And then you give space for the room to answer. And then you ask, all right, it's 2020, Project X did not ship. What went wrong? And by framing the questions in these ways, it gets the team to collectively think about what they want to avoid and how they want to work together. It also gets them pulling from past experiences so that everyone can bring to the table things that have worked well for them, and then it opens a discussion about how they want to work. And this works a lot better than asking the questions which I used to ask my team, which was, okay guys, how do we want to work together? What should our process be? This gets people to dig a little bit deeper and think about it in a little bit different way. It's been really successful for us so far. Okay, visibility. I've heard it time and time again, I'm sure you guys have heard it too, uh, teams not knowing what design is working on. And this is where design can get the reputation of being a little bit of a black box. And when you get people working together in embedded models, which is really great for building community and empathy, visibility becomes extremely important. You need to find a way to get teams to come together and look horizontally across your organization so that they understand all work that's happening. And we faced this problem at Pinterest because teams were embedded in these product pillars. So these are a few examples of the product pillars that we have at Pinterest. And there wasn't a space for people to come together horizontally and look across the entire org. And it was really important for us to solve this problem because users don't care how your org is structured. They experience one product and it's important that that product is cohesive. Thus, the idea of visual status was born. So visual status is a 30-minute weekly meeting where design leads, managers, and directors come together and review work that's happening in that moment, in that week, on the design team. And the sole purpose of the meeting is to create visibility and call out any overlaps. And we've seen a lot of success with this because one, it forces connection, it gets design leadership together from all different pillars to see the work that's happening on every team. And there have been countless misalignments flagged from this meeting, which has then prompted teams to go offline, collaborate together, and figure out a way to, to resolve it. And this is a huge step forward for us in creating that one cohesive experience for our users. So how does this work? Here's a screenshot from our visual status of the guidelines that are put up at the beginning of every meeting just to remind people why we're there and what the meeting is for. And this meeting works for two reasons. One, there's an extremely specific goal. This is not a critique. There is no discussion about design fidelity, quality, if you have differing opinions. This is just for visibility and misalignments. Any discussion happens outside of this meeting. And to enforce that, we have a moderator whose sole purpose is to make sure that we keep the meeting moving so that we get through every design that's happening in that moment on the design team in 30 minutes. And it's actually pretty successful. So here's a template of our team's visual status doc. You'll see at the, uh, at the top it has the team, the key point of contacts, and then the project name, what phase in the design process it's in, and what platform it's on. And at Pinterest, the design lead is responsible for maintaining the stock, dropping in designs, and speaking to the designs at a high level in that meeting. So that brings me to documentation. When you're trying to build visibility and alignment, you need to capture that information somewhere to make sure that learnings are captured and it's easily shareable and accessible across the company. But things I've heard from my team around documentation is it's boring, it's hard to maintain, and I don't have time to do it. And that's the common pitfall of documentation is that it's often not optimized for how teams actually work. So of course no one's gonna do it. 
So as a cross-functional partner, I ever asked you, like, why are you working on that? And what problem are we trying to solve? Maybe you've experienced scope creep. Or maybe you've seen something ship and you have no idea how it got approved or out into the world. Each of those problems can be solved by some lightweight documentation. And when I joined Pinterest, documentation was inconsistent across many different teams. And I'll still say we haven't hit document nirvana, um, but we have gotten a lot better. And after a lot of trial and error and trying to figure out what would work in terms of documentation, there are three th documents that were key to unlocking our teams. And that's the brief, the project tracker, and the experiment tracker. So let's start with the brief. So sometimes this is called the PRD, product requirement doc, but a simple brief can change the course of your work, can save you time, immediately get clarity, alignment, and visibility into what you're doing and why. And briefs were not the common practice when I started at Pinterest. We were scrappy, we moved fast, briefs would only slow us down. But once introduced, they became really important in helping teams align, and we actually moved faster. And because my project teams were completely allergic to any process, I needed to ensure that the brief was lightweight and easy enough to maintain so people would actually do this. And so I identified a few key elements that were key to making a brief successful. And this is the actual template that we use now. And that has a one, project, a one sentence problem statement, one sentence goal, high level success metrics, how are we gonna know if we've reached our goal, and then a timeline. What are our milestones and when is this gonna be done? So naturally, I introduced this template. My teams were like, oh my God, thank God, finally, of course I'm gonna fill this out. No. <laughs> no. I ended up filling this out for a very long time until it was more widely adopted. So how did I get people to do it? it essentially came down to enforcing a principle. Is there a brief became my constant question. If there was no brief, no design. I have a limited pool of resources. I need to make sure I'm putting my people on the highest impact project that has clear goals. Without a brief, designers were getting pulled into these never-ending, ambiguous problems with no clear path to success. And eventually, my team of program managers started asking this question too. And over time, our product partners, our design leadership knew that this was coming, so they would just fill it out. And once they did, and it became more widely adopted, they saw how much faster and clearer projects would become. All of a sudden, making trade-off decisions became a lot clearer, too, because there was no more scope creep. It was really clear what we were trying to achieve. Okay, the project tracker. Very exciting stuff for an ops person. <laughs> this comes in all shapes and sizes, and it's critical that you find the right type of tracker that works for your team. So I'll just run through a couple examples that we use at Pinterest. But the key to a good project tracker is that it captures who's doing what, when. So here's one example. A lot of our team uses Trello, which is a pretty lightweight, easy way. It essentially is a board where you create tasks, you can assign it to people, add in designs, descriptions, anything you want in these little cards. And you'll see in this example, it, each column represents a different phase of the product design life cycle. So this is a really clear, easy way just to do some lightweight project tracking. Alternatively, if spreadsheets are your jam, there's a, this is a more typical project tracker that's used as well. And it still hits those key points. Who's doing what when? And in this example, it actually shows too, what does success look like? Okay, if you ever find yourself in an organization that does a lot of A-B testing, having a way to track your progress is essential. How else are you gonna know if you've reached your goal? So the key elements of a good experiment tracker are having an experiment with a link, a description of what you're testing, the status, where is it in this process of experimentation, the impact to metrics, uh, company metrics, timing, when is this gonna be done, when are we gonna review it, and an owner. And at Pinterest, so this is how it manifests itself a lot of times, at Pinterest, eng managers are responsible for maintaining this document. And this not only helps keep track of everything that's in flight and going on, but it also serves as a reference 
as to why we ship something or why we shut it down. And so this also becomes an archive that teams can go to and look at so that they don't have to keep retesting things or reinventing the wheel. And before I move on from documentation, I just want to talk a little bit about accountability. Because documentation only works if people are actually accountable to maintain it. So at Pinterest, each discipline uh, usually takes a different part of this, these three doc documents that I've just walked through. PM usually owns the brief. Design usually keeps ownership on the project tracker. Eng does the experiment tracker. But the point I want to leave you with is that anyone can own documentation. And it doesn't have to be a heavy lift. It can be lightweight. And it can be malleable. You have to find what works for your team. And it's important that trackers uh, or your documentation answers these four questions. What's the task? Who's owning it? When will it be done? And where is it in the process? Okay, so that brings me to my final point, adapt. Everything I just mentioned in this entire presentation, get ready to change it and stretch it and grow. Because people are messy, orgs are made of people, people stretch and grow. How many of you have had a reorg in the past six to 12 months? <laughs> Maybe you've added somebody to your team or restructured. These are all reasons why you're gonna need to adapt. And you can't force process. And I'm an ops person telling you, don't force process, it's not gonna work. Meet your team where they are. You can't take them from zero to 100. Get comfortable in that ambiguity and that mess. Work on iterating towards an ideal future state. I learned this the hard way. Uh, when I first started about three and a half years ago at Pinterest, I saw everybody was using different tools and documentation. And so I was like, this is super inefficient. Let's all get on the same tool. Think about the efficiencies we'll gain, the visibility that'll be created. And I put together a proposal. I got our team on a new tool. I piloted it, and it completely failed. Total organ rejection. And that's because I didn't meet my team where they were. I tried to take us from zero to 100. So I had to pivot. I had to reassess. I had to look at what my team's needs were and make small iterations over time. We still haven't gotten to that one big, beautiful system that I dream of, but we have made a lot of improvements along the way, and that's okay. Strong opinions loosely held. Have a point of view of where you wanna take your team, but be flexible. It's okay to start somewhere and be okay with it changing. Small changes can make a really big difference. All right, so I just threw a lot of information at you. Lunch is almost here. Here's a quick recap. Alignment and visibility. This is key to unlocking teams, increasing collaboration, and ultimately improving your product. Find ways to build empathy, create role clarity, create visibility into the work that's happening on your team. Documentation. Clear briefs, project trackers, experiment trackers. They don't need to be a heavy lift, and anyone can take ownership of this. They also don't have to be one size fits all. Look at the needs of your team and figure out what would work best. Adapt. Meet your teams where they are. Don't let perfect get in the way of progress. Small changes make really big differences. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was an amazing talk. And the GIF game was really strong, Anne. <laughs> uh...